Hi, Preston. Hi, Tom. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. All right. Relieved to have made it into the session. It's good yeah. reason to be. Are you, are you your people in there? Morning, both. Yeah, I've got two of them. Oh, it's very dangerous, Preston. Whatever you do, don't fall over when you're uh, trying to suck a pen. <laughs> Thanks. Moment. Yeah, I can rely on the ship owner community to point out the, the errors of safety in my ways. Morning, all. Morning, Nick. Hi, Nick. Good morning. How are we doing? I've got this. Uh, I've got this challenge. For you lot, it's like you've got similar. One minute it's brilliant, bright sunlight outside. The next minute a cloud appears. <laughs> I should probably close the curtains behind me, but. I find that gets very depressing. Yeah. Hi, Howard. Hi, Howard. We can't hear you, Howard. No, still can't hear you, Howard. Hey, Bud. Hi, Tom. Hi, everyone. I think we all got the mobile Hi, blue Bud. shirts then. <laughs> uh, but my blue shirt is from my days in the Coast Guard, not from my days as a cadet with Maersk, just for the record. <laughs> so I think we're still having some challenges to hear Howard. Yeah. Michael, can somebody help Howard just get connected if there's anything? Hi, Tom. Yeah, I'm just trying to work on that at the moment. Howard, so if you leave the panel um, and then rejoin, we should be able to get your microphone working. Are we still alone in here, Michael, or are others? <laughs> no, we have 30 people within the session as well. Ah, okay. We did start in uh, about 12 minutes, is that right, Michael? In one, yeah, exactly. So Howard should be just joining now. I've just accepted him into the panel. Hello. Good morning, Howard. You can hear me? We can hear you. 
Right. Well, I think brilliant. Brilliant. So <laughs> after that small technical glitch, I'd like to welcome everybody to our environmental panel this morning. Uh, we, I'd like to thank um, Fraser Nash for sponsoring the panel today, and uh, we might as well move straight into an introduction. And uh, what I'm the way we're going to run the panel is, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves, make a very short couple of remarks, and then we'll get into a uh, facilitated discussion. The topics on, for this panel is the environmental panel. We've had some good remarks, I believe, uh, in the preceding panel, the plenary panel, from uh, Dr. Henderson and Nicholas Takos and Paddy Rogers around the decarbonisation challenges. And perhaps that's where we'll spend most of our time. But uh, there's opportunities for you to raise questions in the chat and the support from the chamber will be helping us facilitate that discussion. And with that then, perhaps I'll start at my top left, which is Tristan. Would you like to introduce yourself? Good morning. Um, my name is Tristan Smith. I'm a researcher at University College London. We have a team that focuses on the decarbonisation of the shipping industry. Do you want me to follow on immediately with a, just a couple of quick remarks? Yes, I think so, Tristan. That would be great. And for those, because I forgot to introduce myself, I'm Tom Strang from Carnival. And I just thought I'd better make sure you know who I am. Thank you very much. Tristan, off you go. Thank you. So the perspective that we come from having studied this subject of decarbonisation for about a decade is that we're now entering what we think will be a very brutal decade. We know from the climate science that we need about a 45% absolute emission reduction across all sectors of the economy by 2030 to be in line with avoiding dangerous climate change. And that's that's um, a message that's now been taken up widely across government. So China have obviously set their 2060 zero target. Japan and Korea have set zeros, UK has already set zero before that process. And it's not just the governments that are changing, but the financiers and the corporates that shipping operates in, in, in an ecosystem to um, help enable world trade to work. So we have, a, we have this, this broad buy-in to the high level political statement, which is derived from the climate science. The problem and why it's brutal is because we do not have the regulatory specificities that we all would like, I guess, in order to be given the certainty that we need for the investment decisions. And so um, I guess my, my opening remark is just that it's going to be a very tough decade, which I think everyone's well aware of. We know regulation will be important, but we can't wait for it. And some intelligence has to be incorporated into decision making about the sort of 20, 30 time scale and what might happen if the rate of change continues to accelerate as it has been doing. Interesting. Um, a brutal decade. So, Nick, would you like to introduce yourself and just give us a couple of uh, thoughts and then we'll move on? Yeah, th thanks, Tom. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks to the Chamber for putting the panel together. Uh, so, I'm Nick Brown, uh, recently appointed as uh, Group CEO at Lloyd's Register. And um, for, for Lloyd's Register, we've had the pleasure of supporting the industry through the three previous propulsion revolutions, if you like, from sail to coal to oil. And of course, we're determined to play a key role in this fourth propulsion revolution. And I am, I am pleased to say that the pandemic hasn't slowed down collaboration between ship owners, builders, engine makers, flags, class, and just as importantly, the new fuel suppliers. I agree with Tristan's comment that regulation uh, is still really needed and required, but it isn't stopping the engineers in our industry to collaborate, uh, uh, particularly with the uh, fuel supply uh, industry. And I'm confident from the projects that we've been involved with so far that we will have safe and robust multi-fuel, but zero carbon ready deep sea ship designs ready in the next two to three years. Having said that, we now see two large challenges for the industry to overcome and uh, Graham has referred to them uh, in the keynote remarks actually and that is as it stands today unlike the last three revolutions there is not going to be any commercial advantage with this revolution the new fuels are going to be as it stands two to three times more expensive than today's fuels and like we saw with LNG and probably still see to some extent with LNG we're in danger of the chicken and egg situation where the ship designs are likely to be ready, but the land-based infrastructure may not be. Uh, and that's why at Lloyd's Register we launched the uh, Maritime Decarbonisation Hub uh, in December last year, 
not just to bring together the technical subject matter experts within the industry, but also to hopefully provide a bridge to other industries, governments, and uh, sector agnostic NGOs and advisors. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, interesting, uh, a few interesting points there, which I hope we'll be able to continue on in a moment. Bud, over to you. Well, thank you, Tom. And I'm Bud Dar, the Executive Vice President for Maritime Policy and Government Affairs at the MSC Group. Uh, we are uh, an operator of a diverse group of ships, uh, including about 560 container ships, as many people know. And we're also the uh, third largest cruise line to date uh, with 18 modern cruise ships on the water, plus uh, large scale ferries and uh, some high speed ferries in the Mediterranean and a few row rows and a few bulk carriers uh, to add into the mix. I only mention that diversity in our fleet because as we discuss things internally and look at what the solution sets look like going forward, it's really kind of a microcosm of, of much of the entire industry. So uh, one thing that, that we have found that I think I would like to stress as an important message here is that uh, it, it, it is not wise in our view to look for one particular solution as being the solution. It's gonna require a multitude of solutions based upon the level of autonomy that's required for a particular ship, uh, its size, its expected lifespan, whether it's a new build or a retrofit. Uh, there are a lot of factors that go into that. And, and the other reason why I think it's important that we look for multiple solutions is not just because one may not fit everything, but also we can't afford to take the risk that we're wrong on one solution as, as a community, because we all know about de-risking our investments for the, the sake of, of, of financial considerations, but uh, there's something more important in play here, and, and that's de-risking the pathway we choose with regard to climate change. If we were to get too far down a particular path, and then it turns out not to be viable for our particular transport mode or a, a significant segment of, of our community, uh, we can't afford to be wrong and waste that time and not have a diversity of choices out there. So I think it's important that we be creative. We keep an open mind. We look for a range of solutions as, as my company uh, is, is going forward. The, the second thing I'll, I'll mention is, is a very important point from our perspective is collaboration. Although I agree on, on one level with what Tristan said that regulations are important here. And I think that uh, sensible, thoughtful, pragmatic, but meaningful regulations are put in place, uh, particularly at a global level, because this is a global problem. Um, but it is not an impediment to moving forward in itself. They go hand in glove because you need some regulatory catalysts, not just inside our sector, but also perhaps with technology producers and fuel producers as well to bring these solutions to the workplace, the, uh, to the uh, marketplace. But the single most significant impediment we're facing right now is not lack of regulation, it's lack of viable solutions at scale for us. And I think, as Nicolas Sacco said in his comments, you know, you have many responsible ship owners that are looking for those good solutions when they're there and when they're available at scale for us in the marketplace, you'll see a lot of uptake and, and it will happen very quickly. Uh, but that being said, that can of course be encouraged by the right regulatory environment as well. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Bud. So now over to Howard, um, as, as I, perhaps the non-shipping uh, member of the panel, perhaps you could give us your perspective. And again, thank you very much for your company sponsorship. Oh, pleasure, and thank you. Um, Howard Longley, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm a sustainability consultant. I, I lead Fraser Nash's Sustainability Services. Um, I've been working in sustainability and carbon for 20 years or so. Um, and so I find myself advising all sorts of organizations on how to develop their carbon strategy. And before I was at Fraser Nash, I worked for British Telecom. I worked in BT sustainability team, and my job was to develop and drive the decarbonisation strategy there. So I have some I have some experience of owning the problem, as it were, in a large organisation, different sector, um, and I'm hoping that some of that's going to be useful and and uh, you know give give some pers interesting perspectives here. The um, Initial comments I'd, I'd, I'd want to make, I'd, I'd, just to pull together some strands there. I, I love the definition of the, the next decade as a brutal decade. Um, 
because of course it will be for some for others it's going to be a de decade of opportunity um is, you know it, what it is is going to be a really important period of change and um for for those organizations that find themselves having to change um where maybe those where there's not a lot of inertia in the organization then that is going to be brutal um, i'm afraid and it's going to be like an extinction period you know there are going to be businesses that 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 cease to operate but there are going to be those that grow and there are going to be new businesses that thrive and if you're one of those where you sort of part of the old establishment as it were through no fault of your own you're now operating ships that are going to be using the wrong type of fuel you rapidly need to change you need to you need to really be on the on the the front foot as it were in developing and getting ready for those new solutions and that's not easy because of all the challenges that have just been said we don't know yet what the solutions are but there are things that can be done there are and there are things that can be learned from other industries about how to how to manage that particular challenge i think i do think um you know one, one thing i wanted to say also is that we really are at a tipping point you know having been in this field being desperately disappointed by the pace of policy um, implementation for a long time now it feels as though things are changing and it's not all because policy is coming together although it seems to be happening that way um it's a it's a sort of a nice coalescence between regulation um or at least an ambition for the, for the right sort of regulation now um investors um consumers and voters um and, and technology all coming together pulling in the same direction um and uh you know i i think that means we're at a tipping point which means that you know we can't just keep putting off combating climate change in the way that we have been for the last couple of decades it's really going to start to happen and start and it's going to surprise us all how fast it's going to happen i think well thank you howard um just to come back a little bit to the experiences and we heard this mentioned in the previous uh, panel when the when patty was talking to graham and nikos what lessons can we learn in the shipping sector from other sectors where you know where are those opportunities you talked about getting inertia for more traditional companies and i think most of us would probably say that shipping is very much perceived as being very traditional i would not necessarily agree that that's the case in, in all cases but clearly where are those opportunities and where do you see that um, the learnings can come from those other sectors you know paddy mentioned what's happened with big pharma recently Bud mentioned collaboration, yeah. you know, so where do you see those opportunities for us to piggyback or at least to collaborate? Well, I, I think everybody's learning. Um, there are there are some areas where, 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 where which I'll go into where I think you can, the shipping sector can learn from other sectors. But it's, it's probably worth starting off by saying that actually we're all in this together. And by all, I mean, it's not just the shipping sector, it's all sectors. You know, um, each and every sector in each and every country is going to be facing transformational change all at the same time. Um, so some sectors are slightly ahead of the curve um, and some are, some are slightly trailing at the moment. But actually, there's still a huge amount of change that's required in all sectors. So we're going to, there's going to be a continuous process of learning from one another. Um, it's a whole ecosystem that needs to change. Uh, the word ecosystem was used earlier. It's, it's, it's a great word to describe what needs to happen. So shipping is part of numerous ecosystems, but the important one I think here is, to, is the energy ecosystem. You know, along with road, rail, aviation, domestic heating and commercial heating, um, and, the, and the power um, sector, which needs to, which needs to produce um, renewable fuels. Um, all of that needs to change in harmony um, and so it's no, it's it's not a matter of saying, well, you know, of looking internally and saying, well, how do we respond to external change? It's actually about partnering with other sectors to help make that external, to help make that change happen altogether in a way that works for the whole ecosystem. Uh, uh, and that all sounds very sort of general, um, deliberately so. But I think you need to work out what your best bets are. Now. There's a big debate over what is going to be the best fuel. Um, personally, my opinion is it's not going to be a best fuel, and I think that's echoed by some people already. There's going to be a number of different fuels that we all need to be able to operate, um, depending on context. Um, 
but the question is how do you start investing in a way in in, in in adopting those new fuels in a way that is low regret just as bud was saying you don't want to go too far down the wrong path only to have to start again on, on something else um so but the but the learning there i think is from commercial electric vehicle fleets you know this this has already started to happen you know we the people who are, the companies that operate commercial van fleets are adopting electric vans now at scale and the answer is really simply that you don't have to do everything at once you know you're not talking billions of pounds of investments on day one you're talking several hundred thousand because you start with a few vans uh, and you deploy those in places where you know there's a viable long-term use case and you learn from that deployment and things grow gradually. So it's about making intelligent decisions about where those first pilot cases go um, and being adaptable to change. I think um, I'll just finish by saying, you know, the aviation sector is a key, a key partner for you in that it's also on a very similar journey, different drivers, perhaps even different fuels. But I would, I would, I would recommend actually going going out there and, and, and making conversations happen because you're going to be sharing that so those same challenges and you'll be able to learn from one another the last last point is where there's a will there's a way uh, you know things seem very difficult only because we're used to the status quo and we're used to there being sort of an inbuilt inertia as i said but you know if the cat if the pandemic has shown us anything that actually once everybody understands the challenge and, and has a desire to make those changes happen things can happen very quickly so i do think there will be a you know a, a rapid shift and it's actually going to be hard to keep up i think the the attributes of successful businesses are going to change and it's going to be the businesses that are able to adapt to incorporating experimentation learning innovation as as, as part of their business as usual um, so, you know, and, and that involves an awful lot of conversations. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if my experience at, 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 at BT tells me anything, it's actually you have to spend so much more of your time talking to people than you expect because it takes every single individual a little bit of time to get the issue. Once they get it, then things start to move nicely. But then you do eventually get to a tipping point where enough people get it, enough critical mass, and actually things just sort of cascade and take off from there. But uh, it's, it's going to take everybody an awful lot of conversations. And, uh, you know, that we're going to be having conferences like this for, for a long time. Oh, thank you, Howard. That's very that's very interesting. I think, you know, certainly in our segment, we've always seen in adversity, there are opportunities. And that's really, you know, we've got to be the glass half full, I think, in this particular uh, environment. But do you want to come back on any of Howard's points? I, I will. And it it's largely to to maybe reemphasize from my own perspective many of the things Howard said because I think it is important to keep things in a perspective. We, as a sector, account for two to three percent of the anthropogenic uh, loading at the moment. Not to minimize that contribution or, or our um, you know how much we add to the challenge, but rather to make the point that we and ourselves are not going to drive the bigger picture decarbonization solutions for society. We rather have to do our part and be ready to uh, accommodate them and, and be uh, involved in, in trials and helping those vendors that want to bring fuels and technologies to the marketplace so that we're ready for that. But we shouldn't kid ourselves into saying that that our 270 million metric tons of fuel or so that we consume right now is going to drive the energy markets. It's not. But it is really important we work as part of that bigger community working on these energy solutions. The other reason I think it's important to, to keep in mind that sense of community is not only developing the solution sets, but remember that good ideas for energy uh, conversion or production are not going to be just good ideas for our sector. And I think a good uh, example of that is, is, is green hydrogen that, you know, to get to 
you know, green ammonia or um, e-alcohols or synthetic LNG, you may very well need to get to green hydrogen first. And right now there's only about 70 million metric tons of that produced. And it's all sp- uh, of, of hydrogen at all, of which is very small quantity, is actually green hydrogen at the moment, which is what we really need as a gateway to these other things. To get that scaled up, it's not like we're the only people who need hydrogen or the derivatives from it. We're going to have to compete with that in the marketplace. And if we haven't participated in the development of being ready for that, uh, encouraging it, sending the demand signals, and getting our infrastructure ready that gets down to the ship level, working with the partners that do that sort of work, we're not going to get our fair share because we are going to have to compete with other users uh, for what the good solution sets look like out there. Um, But I I see more opportunity than downside. I'm an optimist. I mean, I have to be an optimist. I know we're going to decarbonize. We know we have to decarbonize. We know we will have to fully decarbonize with or without additional specific shipping regulations. That's going to happen one way or another. And, and we have to be ready for it. We have to be right in the middle of it and part of that broader community that's trying to solve this problem overall for society. Thank you, Bud. Tristan, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about some of the some of the challenges that we've got there in the synergy piece? Yeah, so, so I have a comment about the general energy system first, which is that um, one of the key changes that will happen this decade is we will electrify more things than we've ever had electricity before so actually one of this point about synergies is really important because we have a diminishing number of sectors with which we will have a common energy need um, if you think of how we use gas and oil across transport and heat and industry today much of that will be electrified because that is by far the cheapest solution for them and i think a lot of the hydrogen economy is judging how much competition they're going to face from electric electricity so when you boil it down and you look at some quite um, aggressive cost scenarios for reduction in electrification costs, then there are very few sectors that need hydrogen. One of them is heavy industry, because there might well be some high temperature applications that you're not going to get electrification from efficiently. One of them is obviously the fertilizer industry. Um, One of them might be the power sector, but in the form of renewable energy trade, and I'll come back to Japan in a second. And then we have the aviation sector that's still going to need a liquid fuel of some sort that might start from hydrogen. And then you have shipping. So actually, our our bedfellows, our companions in the synergies that we're looking for are, are, are pretty limited, which might be to a, to an advantage from ha- Howard's point that you know <laughs> there's a lot of talking that might need to be done. Um, but you, but to Bud's point, shipping needs to get into that conversation in, in a way that it hasn't at the moment. And the UK is a really interesting example of this. In the Prime Minister's ten point plan, the ele- the application for hydrogen that is highlighted is domestic heat which, you know, from any any engineering perspective makes no sense. Domestic heat needs to be electrified. But because the lobby for boilers going to gas, uh, from gas to hydrogen was winning, um, that's what the government thought the hydrogen application was. What they really should have had in their 10-point plan was the application of hydrogen is the shipping industry, not necessarily as hydrogen fuel, but as a hydrogen derivative. And, and that's where we're losing at the moment. We're not influencing at the highest levels of government in a government which is very aligned to decarbonisation to get them to understand the need for massive expansion of hydrogen capacity and production or import. And if we do the sums on a national, on a sorry, on a global scale, we estimate we're going to need about 50 gigawatts of electrolyzers dedicated to hydrogen production in addition to all the other types of fuels, so biofuels that might be sitting alongside it in the transition by 2030 with about $400 billion dollars committed to the to the investment in that supply side um, evolution. So in just a decade, this transition from zero investment that we have at the moment and zero recognition of shipping as an end user of this feedstock is, is going to have to transition dramatically. Um, and Japan, I just want to come back to that because I think they've really nailed this. And you can see this emerging in the last couple of weeks, but over the last two years. So they have got an energy system which is doesn't have the opportunity for renewables that we have in the UK, which actually gives them an advantage in this circumstances because they have to import renewable energy. And they're doing that, obviously, through uh, contracts with Australia, amongst other countries. And in order to import it, they have to figure out the infrastructure for managing renewable energy as a liquid. And so that's meant investigation into liquid hydrogen import, but also ammonia import. But they already have their government energy strategy that says we will need to be co-firing ammonia in our power stations and commit to importing about three million tonnes per annum by the time we're in 2030, which the shipping industry is leveraging. And so Itoshu was one that's announced to buy 
ammonia powered ships because they can see that the infrastructure that they will leverage to Graham's earlier points that shipping isn't going to be the only sector that that does this on its own. So they, they are in a position because of that Japanese government investment because of the energy system, they will be able to leverage that and move quite fast. And I think we need to spot the other niches and also find ways to, to maximize the awareness of um, the scale of supply side change, which I think is still not not correct. Interesting. Interesting. You know, until we get liquid electricity, um, we, we need to be thinking about um, these alternatives. Nick, do you want to um, comment on this? Well, I, I I just think um, I, I would echo all of the comments earlier. I think that's that's the main reason why um, we need to be thinking about the whole infrastructure, the the, the broader sector. I mean, to date, we've relied on a fuel that no one else really has demanded. Uh, it's it's a byproduct that we we've, we've put to use very very effectively to trade and and to uh, to propel the industry and. The biggest challenge that we've got going forward, I think, is just as Tristan's outlined, is recognizing that whatever the fuel is, whether it's green electrons and we're plugging in ships because they're doing short sea trade or it's some kind of um, uh, uh, liquid fuel in the future, there'll be multiple industries that are looking for it. And and I love Howard's comment actually around no regrets. I mean, that 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 is that is that is perhaps the big difference between uh, maritime and let's say uh, Amazon buying um, hybrid vans, um, our assets do have much longer life cycles. And I don't think anybody in this industry wants to see our life cycles or the life of an asset artificially reduced. So we do need to be going down this no regrets route. And that probably means a fuel flexibility or, or at least rapidly gaining experience from demonstrator projects whether they're demonstrators on methanol demonstrators on hydrogen uh ammonia etc but but we've got to try and get those demonstrators into the industry as quickly as we can uh in order to gain that experience thank you nick i don't know how if you want to come back on anything otherwise we can start looking at some of the questions that are coming in yeah, just a very quick one. It's not no regrets. You know, you can't go through life with no no regrets. You'd just be paralysed. Um, it was low low regrets. So, in other words, just just figuring out how you can how you can deploy uh, you know new experimental assets in a way that minimises the risk. But we do need to experiment, and there's inherent risk in all of that. Right. Um, just a quick. Uh, so, so we've got a question here. I'm going to jump backwards and forwards between the discussion and the question if we can. So please, the, those of you, the 112 people who we've got on our panel, which is great, can you please keep putting your questions into the chat? Um, we've got a question about raising large amounts of finance for research and development and providing the infrastructure for new projects will be key. Do you see this as an issue easily when banking confidence in the maritime fuel supply sector is so low after high profile failures, frauds and sanctions issued? Do you see finance coming from non-traditional sources? Um, who wants to take a stab at that? Tristan, do you want to give a, have a view on that one? Um, yeah, this is quite... Very vocal about financing and where it's going to come from. <laughs> yeah, um, so I think there's, a, there's an expression of the sort of patient capital, which refers to relatively low cost, but long-term capital that, that might, um, take a while for it to get a return on investment and I you know I don't know enough about the financing of the current bunkering but the conversations that we're in is that some of the institutional investors the pension funds the the organizations that could deploy patient capital but aren't at the moment are very interested in opportunities in the space in the hydrogen supply chain and in the and in some midstream processes that would convert that into something usable because they can see their ESG parameters and B that that it's got this potential to create some extraordinary returns, which over the timescales that they're interested in, given that, you know, a lot of their asset investment is is not looking that good for returns in the 2030s. They, they really need to be able to have assets which will. So I think I think if that's non-conventional, because the pension funds don't fund the bunkering structures at the moment, then then I think that's one way that we might see it. But I think the others, the other way we might see it is in more vertical integration of the fuel supply with the owner operation side and the um, 
other stakeholders that sit within that that particular value chain within the shipping industry. And I think that like the, this, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to Itoshi because I think they're quite an interesting case study. But that's one of the things that enabled them to close this loop and actually have the confidence to order some ammonia powered ships was because they are a trading house. They have some of the interest in the bunkering space. So they have many tentacles into multiple steps in the value chain and were able to perhaps raise finance as a corporation, but then use that finance across all of those areas to make sure that the, that the risks and the opportunities that they see are spread and they're not just a bunker operator with a single silo around that bunker operation that has to make this impossible guess as to what what fuel it's going to be in five years time which i recognize is impossible so so i think we're going to see corporations that have got this potential to to vertically integrate that the 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 value chain more than others and uh, i can think of a few other examples that sit in that space like trafiguro who have kind of got massive bunkering operations but also commodities trade and so you can see i've got the, the ability to bridge and maybe that's a way to channel some of that new finance in or we're going to see disruptors and you can imagine organizations like yara who um, are already able to raise a lot of finance moving into uh, a sector with um, with a disruptive offer of a fuel which is much lower cost. You can see governments also starting to play a role in that in the way that we have seen them in some of the oil and, oil and gas play as well. So I think I, I recognize this is a very different picture to an industry that we have today, but I don't think that the cost of the availability of capital is a, is a limit here. Um, the capital needs to see the sector take a direction of travel. Possibly it needs to see a certain level of regulation or it needs to see a convergence of opinion. And when those parameters are all in place, then it's got large uh, amounts behind it, as we've already seen from the signals that BlackRock and others are, are giving. Mm. So thank you. Nick, do you have a comment on that? Anything you'd to add? I think I think the other thing to add here, uh, Tom, which which is a positive for the industry, it's a positive for the for the challenge or the opportunity that we're addressing is that we've seen clearly with initiatives such as uh, the Poseidon principles or the sea cargo charter initiative where the broader uh, let's say sector stakeholders are very much supporting this transition and playing their part whether that's coming from our traditional financial sources whether lenders to uh, existing uh, shipping portfolios are, are talking to their um, talking to their customers and understanding their plans to green or de or, or decarbonize uh, existing fleets that they're financing and we're seeing charterers play a really important role here to understand how they can also support the um, investment in greener lower lower carbon lower emission uh, assets so I think it's it's those are really important aspects we I, I agree that there's 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 a real opportunity here for more capital to flow into the industry because clearly this transition is going to require significant capital to see uh, broader stakeholders playing that role from from insurance sector from the chartering sector and from the financial financial sector thanks nick I, i'm but i'm wondering if the if you see any linkages here to some of the other opportunities that, that are being discussed at the moment within the maritime sector the regulatory sectors for raising funds for research and development um the green fund, the, the you know the funds that the you know the industry is proposing at the IMO. Do you see a linkage here as well? I do, and I think that if we all keep in mind what we really have to do, which is decarbonize, and that's part of the IMO initial strategy to fully decarbonize. People kind of conveniently forget that sometimes, but that's already part of the initial strategy. There's no doubt in my mind it will be strengthened uh, in, in the 2023 version of the final strategy. And look at how those pieces fit together. I mean, this all kind of comes together as a, a tapestry that, that ultimately could reflect a, a unity of effort towards sincerely trying to decarbonize the entire sector. And one important piece of that is uh, funding to catalyze research and development, both on the fuel side and the, the technology um, with regard to engines or alternative conversion devices like fuel cells. I, I tend to think actually the, the, the fuel part of it and particularly fuel delivered all the way to the ship where we actually need to consume it 
is going to be the long pole in the tent here. I, I feel like the um, the ability to adapt engines and storage systems and technologies that have been used in other places to a shipboard environment are not going to be the actual technological obstacle here. But we've still got a lot of work to do there. Like examples are uh, scaling up fuel cells um, of of the the two leading candidates. I think that are likely to be used for the marine environment. Uh, I'm sorry, the marine shipboard environment, I should say, and uh, also uh, scaling up um, batteries and continuing to work on reducing the volumetric storage space that's required for those. Those are good examples where I think investments on the technology side to go along with investments on the uh, fuel side could be really important. So that can come from the proposal before the IMO right now to establish a, uh, an international uh, maritime research fund, uh, which would be funded by ship owners. They've been agreeing to do that. It's kind of strange to me that uh, when ship owners have volunteered to pay this money to help, it's meeting some political resistance for reasons that I think have almost nothing to do with the underlying goal of that, which is to provide some seed money to these ideas. It could be provided through uh, funding sources uh, such we see as the, the EU through the Innovation Fund or maybe Horizon Europe or in the 750 billion uh, euro uh, recovery fund that's going to be administered through the member states of which, uh, if I recall correctly, I think a third has to be um, at a minimum dedicated towards um, decarbonization technologies or consistent with the Green Deal. Why not? Let's help out recovering the European industrial base, um, allow them to continue to be uh, leaders in this innovation uh, area, which is really ripe with need for us, and at the same time, accelerate the bringing of these uh, fuels and technologies to the marketplace. And then I would look for other third parties to help as well. And Nick mentioned the interest of the finance sector, which I think is important. I think the details on how that is done um, need to be worked on uh, because as we're seeing the first round of analysis come through, I think there's more work to be done there to get it right. But I think the core underlying principle is a good one. You know, we're all in this together, including on the finance side. Um, so can we collaborate to set some benchmarks and um, use both carrots and sticks to help that along? But Howard, uh, do you want, have you got anything to add at the moment? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd like to just make a couple of points there. I, absolutely right. The the finance sector is uh, the investment community is a key part of the ecosystem. Absolutely spot on. Um, I would say I don't know in, much about how the um, um, fuels are and R and D in the in the industry is financed at the moment. But some general principles I would like to make. Um, there are there are investors that look for different types of risk profile. So there are some that look for high risk, high reward. And there are some that look for sustained long-term returns. Um, to you know, be oversimplistic, but you know, there will be different types of activity that are attractive to different different types of investors. Another point to make is that, you know, the the investment community is now seriously looking at the long-term health of organisations, based on their ability to adapt to a decarbonisation to a de decarbonising economy, and you know, so we see with for climate related financial disclosure, for example, which is becoming widely uh, widely um, taken up, that um, there are physical risks to climate change and there are transitional risks. So the, the shipping industry faces significant um, transitional risks in that there's going to be a world around, around it that is going to be operating on renewable sources of energy. Um, and the shipping industry doesn't yet know how they can do that because there's no there's no obvious there's no obvious um, solution just yet. So the, if you want to attract investment, you are going to have to demonstrate a strategy for managing that risk, and that will include a range, a diverse portfolio, I might say, of of R and D projects. Uh, and so, you know, actually, it's going to be critical to your ability to raise finance to be doing the right sort of R&D. Yeah, Howard, I think that, you know, that's been a very interesting discussion. Um, clearly, there's, I'm looking at the chat and the questions that are being asked. We're seeing a lot of questions coming in about the multiple options of fuels. Um, what you know, what does that mean? Is there risk in the security and the supply chain, etc.? But I'm perhaps going to pop onto one that I, I just see popped up here, which I know is 
pretty contentious at the moment within the industry around the European proposals for the maritime sector to join the EU ETS. Um, perhaps I'd just like to ask what the views of the panel are here. Um, Bud, do you want to kick off on that one? Uh, in short, I think it's not a good idea to address this at a European level. Um, the, the reasons foundationally are it's a global problem, needs a global solution to really make a difference. And all of these you know, concerns about carbon leakage and that go away if you can actually have a global solution. So I would rather see um, that effort put into diplomacy for governments to resolve their differences, particularly between developed and developing governments, um, and, and, and use that unity of effort to create a globally applicable scheme, which, um, you know, why wouldn't we want to support that? I mean, that, 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 <laughs> that, that is the right place to have that discussion. I don't think industry's ever been the obstacle to that happening. It's been diplomatic obstacles between governments, and I think we would contribute constructively to that. You also run uh, with a regional or, or, or purely unilateral national scheme um, the risk of others wanting to retaliate. And I think, because uh, it's essentially a tax on trade, uh, particularly if you looked at maybe just one side of the equation, if you only taxed uh, imports for the carbon and not exports, um, you can predict how uh, some of um, some of the competing countries uh, in the overall marketplace economically, such as China, Brazil, and um, uh, maybe the United States under a different administration might feel that they should do the same thing. And next thing you know, you've got a really, really complicated environment driven by national and, and regional politics rather than globally working together to solve um, the problem. And I think a lot of the issues of administration over it uh, could be resolved if it was done um, Globally, uh, also, I, when you think about just exactly where the taxation goes and what the scope of it is, uh, it, it, it's a really, really complex problem. And if it were to be the full scope of the MRV, uh, a huge proportion of the taxation would actually be for voyages that don't even come close to the EU at the time or for segments of those voyages, including, say, for example, we have services that go from Asia to Europe without an intervening stop. You might have 10,000 nautical miles of, of uh, a ship's emissions that would be taxed by the EU um, specifically if the, the full scope of the MRV were included. So I'm, I'm hopeful that the commission has had a lot of time to think about this. Some might argue they've had 15 years to think about it because it's not the first time we've had this discussion. And then when we see their proposal in June, it will try and balance those equities together with the political pressure, which I realize is very real, very strong in, in Europe to include uh, shipping. But if that's going to happen and shipping is going to be brought into the scope of the existing ETS, it really needs to be done as a thoughtful way to not have cascading negative consequences and perverse disincentives, which is quite possible. And, and uh, certainly limiting that to an intra-EU scheme would um, be, be somewhat more palatable in that regard, but still it, it seems suboptimal. But the politics are very real. Societal pressure is very real. We've got a lot on our shoulders to meet those expectations. And one way or the other, whether it's driven by an ETS or not, and right now there's no solutions uh, technologically to you know, see the tax pay off, um, we still got to deliver and we got to be part of that no matter what. Yeah, thank you, bud. Uh, Tristan, do you want to comment? Because obviously, you know, people are, you know, there's a number of initiatives that are rolling out there, fuel EU, maritime, trading, you know, in different ways. Yeah, perhaps you, I'm sure you have a view. Well, we know you have a view. Let's listen to it. Thank you. I have a, I have a view. It's not exactly the same as buds, I'm afraid. Um, so I like I think uh, I think it's both right. So so there are bits of what Bud said that I strongly agree with. We do will we will need a global solution in due course, but we know that is not going to happen next year, the year after. You know, it's it's a process in the IMO which is going to take years to unfold. In the meantime, we cannot afford to delay. We know this is going to be a brutal decade. We know the capital needs to start moving, and what the EU ETS does is gives us a chance to get public and private co-financing into the decarbonisation of shipping well in advance of anything that comes out of the IMO. And uh, and that's just an opportunity that cannot be missed. Um, I don't quite understand why the sector sees this as a threat, especially given it is inevitable. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I, what I do find interesting is that we have a, a divergence of opinion within the ship owner community. So there are many who are 
now expressing support for the EU ETFs. They can see that there is an upside to it where in, if it is designed in an intelligent way and are trying to lobby constructively on that basis, as long as the rhetoric is we don't want this because we only want an IMO solution, the problem is that that discourages um, the the politicians or the others who are trying to design the solution from, from listening and taking on board the constructive um, design of the system. And that's where it's most critical. Um, there is a risk that what it does is is not very much in terms of um, helping the sector. If we have the low prices that are currently sort of forecast for this decade, so the sort of 50, 60, 70 euros a tonne of CO2, I think we're all aware that doesn't suddenly stimulate a ma major investment in zero carbon fuels. It possibly doesn't even do much to change um, energy efficiency investment, depending on what the underlying oil price is. So, so if that's the only driver of change, then we don't get very much out of it. But if the driver of change is that a decent percentage of the revenues raised from EU ETS get reinvested in the evolution of technologies and the evolution of supply chain, then the sector generally wins. And this is this is the same model that has happened in the uh, renewable energy industry. So we know that Europe and North America paid a disproportionate cost for decarbonizing their economies with solar and wind because they were the early adopters. They were the governments that paid the higher prices for the technologies. They're now reduced in price and many other governments in the global south and other parts of the world can, can afford them and they've become uh, a success story globally because of that. But somebody needs to be making early adoption moves and actually there are arguments why EU ETS is actually an embodiment of CBDRRC, this very difficult concept behind the UNFCCC's process that says that the developed economy should lead the decarbonisation. It's a way in which Europe could actually have much more moral authority, much more potential to win the difficult discussions that we know we're going to have at the IMO, because it's showing that it's actually investing and putting its money where its mouth is, if it's designed correctly and if we don't end up with um, the, the unintended consequences. And I think there are certain specifications that need to be incorporated in that. Thank you, Tristan. It's always good to hear the, different, the, op the opposing view, shall we say. Um, I'd probably suggest that there's quite a lot of common ground um, actually there but there are some fundamental differences nick i know you know lloyd's i'm sure has a view on this yeah well first of all let me say that for for us our view is that regulation is absolutely critical uh, without that regulation i really uh fear we as an industry are not sending a strong enough uh signal to the fuel supplier uh, sector, whether that's green electrons that we're going to demand, or it's a new type of liquid fuel that we're going to demand, and I think that reg so regulation is really required to to send that very strong signal that we're going to be demanding new types of energy, new types of fuel by a certain date and and in significant quantities, and that will give certainty to the land-based infrastructure to make their very challenging investment decisions. Uh, secondly, I think that that regulation will be required to actually provide sufficient incentive to start making the transition. At the moment, it, the, probably the biggest disincentive around the transition is the cost of, of the asset, is the cost of the future fuel. So I think we need that regulation. And uh, all of us, I think, would love that the IMO could move in pace with, with our demand for that regulation. Uh, I have to say, with what I see at the moment, um, is uh, I, I wouldn't be entirely surprised if we see something like we saw previously with the ECAS in the Baltic and the North Sea first, and then I, IMO catching up. Uh, but I, I, I do think, actually, you know, when we talk about IMO in the EU, the, most of the press immediately jumps to deep sea shipping and international trade. And of course, there's a role for national legislation and regional legislation for domestic shipping or interregional interregional shipping and we shouldn't automatically assume that what's introduced in one region should apply equally for let's say intercontinental shipping uh, at the, at the same time as as the sort of national and uh, uh, and regional uh, shipping trading routes Nick. Because certainly, I think I think one of the concerns that many ship owners have is a proliferation of different regimes. You know, we've already seen discussion around that in various parts of the world. With an e if we have, and then as you move into those different regimes, the challenges of recording, reporting, 
um, the mechanisms that, that are put in place. Um, Howard, is there anything that you've seen in other segments and sectors or in your in your in, in the way you're guiding other companies that helps us in shipping here? Is there any views you can bring to the table on that? Probably not so much from the work I've been doing with other with other customers, but perhaps just a, a, a view that I can offer is I think Europe as a concept it has been at the forefront of developing a regional, you know, a globally significant regional approach to environmental regulation. And the ETS is part of that. I've, I've not directly been involved in the ETS, so I don't know the, the ins and outs of how it works. But I do, you know, I've, I've, I hear on, on, you know, through my, my reading and, you know, and conferences and so on, that the price of carbon has been insufficient to drive action in the past. So that's obviously a, a, an important factor. But as, an, as, a, as a mechanism, I do think it's important that the EU continues to expand its regulatory mechanisms. Uh, and, and I think the ETS is an example of something that may not be the, the right answer in the end, but will provide important institutional learning for a bigger, better, more effective global system and i think you know we should probably be quite open and supportive towards it uh, you know not necessarily as an end in itself but maybe a means to an end thank you howard i'm just going to pick up on a couple of i think that you know i think we're having a the, the conversation is uh, driving us in certain directions but i'm going to pick up on a couple of the questions that i'm seeing here in the in, in the chat um we've had some comments in here around the different types of fuels you know there was the question that we took for all the implications that came from the previous session around you know is are we coalescing around one or two fuels at the moment i think one of the you know we've asked the question in the past what would be the most widespread shipping fuel in 2030 is there an answer to that perhaps i'll throw that out there secondly is wind going to play a role? You know, we've listened to Shell and others. We know other companies have looked at wind in the past. Quite challenging in my segment or the type of ships we operate, but in the past we've had uh, wind-powered cruise ships, absolutely. Very small, of course, but uh, not the easiest uh, segment to perhaps put that technology into. And then there is the other question. There's been quite a lot of discussion recently about nuclear. With the costs that we're talking about for transition into these alternative fuels, is there a role for nuclear? Maybe Nick, do you want to um, come back on that first of all, knowing how you have one of the major proponents in these different sectors? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I, 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 I think it's really, it's a really important point actually that we shouldn't be discounting uh, and narrowing in our options. I think Bud mentioned it earlier. We've got to try and think of as many solutions. Uh, I do pick up on. Uh, uh, Nicholas Sakos's comments earlier that he he made a mention that we've we've really down to two engine makers that might, and of course that's probably true for slow speed uh, engines, but we should also be thinking about the op opportunities for fuel cells, for large battery installations, for wind assistance, uh, you know many energy. And I did and I you know tr actually prior to the. Uh, Fukushima tragedy and disaster, there were a number of projects that were underway at that time, specifically looking at liner uh, trade. So point to point type uh, shipping routes where nuclear power could be deployed to larger vessels. Uh, and partic of particular interest was a, a trading route across the Pacific because uh, it obviously tends to tends to suit longer voyages, tends tends to suit where uh, vessels are only going point to point, and then you can get you have you have a chance of getting societal acceptance rather than tramp trade. Uh, but I do I do think that we shouldn't discount nuclear. I think it's an interesting option. Um, it also potentially provides a route to. Um, uh, the way we, that we can optimize manning in the industry and skills within the industry, because I mean, as as we are talking here about uh, what is inevitably going to be a multi-fuel future solution, I think we shouldn't discount the human impact on that and the, the impact it will have on skills within the industry. So clearly, if we're, if we're thinking about the technology and we are thinking about nuclear as an option, we also need to think about the skills that we'd need to bring into the industry to support that as well. 
good point. I think from my own our experience, we've learned a lot in our transition to LNG. And I'm not going to talk, we're not going to talk about LNG here. I think we agreed that beforehand. But clearly, I'm interested to hear, Bud, what your views are as somebody who I well, I think was helped to coin the phrase magic beans, if I remember correctly. Uh, I either helped or I co-opted it from you and also used it. <laughs> uh, but I think that's about right uh, for magic beans. But um, those who know me know um, I, I started my career as a naval nuclear engineer. So I, you know, I have an interest in this, but I always had been quite skeptical of the application of the traditional pressurized water reactors that you see in, in nuclear app or naval applications to the commercial sector and, and outside of a few you know, anomalies out there. And I, I didn't think it held much promise, but I think just going along the lines of my earlier comments and following up on what Nick says, we have to be creative. We have to be open-minded. And I think what's being discussed more prominently now about a, a molten salt reactor type of, of uh, coolant that actually has the fuel interspersed within the coolant rather than uh, enriched fuel plates or fuel cells, I think has some real potential um, that that didn't exist in my mind with pressurized water reactors with regard to cost, maintenance, operation, um, volumetric space, weight. Um, so I think it, it it warrants a look, and I do think we have to be creative. And I'm I'm not going to say it's the answer, but I think it needs to be one of the things we think about. I think we also need to be thinking about carbon capture um, because there is some potential to marinize that technology, and then maybe that buys a little bit more time to bring some of the other fuel solutions to the marketplace if we can. So. Just going back to one point about um, the European ETS, uh, there are different views out there that range from, you know, the European Parliament said up to 50% could go to an ocean fund of which 20% would be for biodiversity and the remainder for research and development. Presumably, that would mean the EU would be taxing international shipping, including extraterritorial legs, to make investments in Europe to promote their decarbonization technology. So I would hope those investments would actually be eligible to be made other places. And then, uh, but maybe in carbon capture, um, maybe in nuclear technology in a marinized form. Um, then I just have to add, I would love to be a fly on the wall when the intervention is made at the IMO, the taxing international shipping in a regional sense with developed countries is somehow an application of the common but differentiated responsibilities uh, principle that the developing countries have been holding so dear. So when that's going to happen, Tristan, let's both be there together. <laughs> um, but I'm guessing that's not going to go over particularly well with the developing countries who view that as to benefit them, not the developed countries to tax international shipping to, uh, you know, support their own industries or their own or their own operating budgets, which is really, in large part, what's being talked about here in, in the EU sense, not to just spend it all on R&D. Thanks, bud. Tristan, do you want to, do you want to add a comment there about, or about any, any of the just remarks from the other panelists right now? Um, I won't, I won't get, but it drag us into a CBD RC oh, debate, I do look forward, I do look forward to the IMA discussion on, as bud says. Um, the, so I'm really at risk of being kind of the inverse of what I should be on this panel. Uh, you know, academics are supposed to be open-minded and kind of very unconstrained. But And I hear what uh, others have said. You know, let, let me go back to the opening remark. This is a brutal decade. We have to halve our emissions by the end of it, right? We cannot spend a decade going, oh, is it nuclear? Oh, is it onboard carbon capture and storage? Oh, is it hydrogen, methanol, or ammonia? Like, there is going to be no choice we have to make decisions at speed which do not allow us i think um to hold things as open as one would like to uh, if this was an academic exercise it's not an academic exercise it's a survival exercise for humanity for trade for the shipping industry and um now that like that has to be tempered with the need for innovation but most most of the technologies that succeed globally don't succeed because they're the best solution. They succeed because they become the dominant solution from whatever cause. And, uh, you know, I have no doubt that if we all set our minds to it, we could design a global nuclear powered shipping fleet and we could have um, all of the multilateral uh, negotiations in place that that would enable even not, not just liner shipping, but tramp shipping to use nuclear power. But uh, it's a bit like Howard's comment early on as well about low regrets. Um, we have to find ways to leverage the 
the extraordinary rate of change that's going to go on around shipping and and leverage the the lowest way that we take risks in that space and nuclear feels like and ccs feel like both like some quite high risk very narrow niche you know only if this certain thing comes true uh solutions there are many others hydrogen derived fuels which have which we know are going to have to exist because of the only the pathways for other sectors and the way that hydrogen is already gaining such speed and momentum in, in the global economy. We know that's a technology cost which is reducing. We know nuclear is a technology cost which is increasing, notwithstanding molten salt, which has been around for five decades and has still been around for five decades. So I like I think I think we just need to be very careful about putting forward a rhetoric that sounds like we are treating this as an academic exercise if we really want the capital to flow at the speed uh, and volume that it needs to flow to the decarbonisation. Well, thank you. I'm afraid we're out of time. It, from what I, I'm, I'm being told that uh, everybody is now, we've got, yeah, the, we should have stopped two minutes ago or no, 11.40, but may, I'd just like to thank all the panellists. I think it's been a very interesting discussion. I don't think we've solved anything, but I hopefully we'll get some views as to where the direction is. We didn't get onto topics around about, are we ready for 2030? But I think taking the comments that we had from before around the fact that, you know, everybody's got to continue working on energy efficiency, and I'm pretty positive. But um, thank you very much, everybody. And good luck. Thank Thanks, you. Sam. Bye, everyone.